Uh, hi, uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, yeah, so uh, this is going to be a kind of a fast talk. Um, so fast that I'm actually even going to bypass that piece um, entirely. Um, this is a piece uh, called Available Light. Uh, it is a piece in which I, I mean, foremost, uh, my practice, I'm interested in, I've always, uh, I approach storytelling from the, the space in which I'm not necessarily interested in telling stories, but I'm very interested in, in storytelling. Um, and by that, I mean, um, I'm interested in the discursive quality of narrative. And um, that takes many different forms, whether it's these kind of cosmic narratives and or these pieces that are more akin to uh, structural mode or aesthetic. Um, and for this piece called Available Light I made, um, I was really interested in the idea of treating um, celluloid, uh, 60 millimeter film in this case, uh, as a sculptural um, as a sculptural, sculptural medium. And in particular, I was interested in uh, uh, treating time as a sculptural medium, um, because that, um, besides the frame and montage, that's kind of one of the one elements of cinema that um, particularly interests me. Um, and real quick, when I talk, use the word cinema here, I'm speaking about the projected image. Uh, that's either digital or celluloid. Um, it's not the, not the first person to come up with that definition, um, but it's something that I, um, I'm thinking about a lot. Um, so for this piece, Available Light, basically, it's a 20-minute looping video in which um, I'm utilizing speed ramping um, in order to uh, basically manipulate the exposure of the film. And if you're not familiar, ramping is a process of slowing down or speeding up film. It's how you accomplish slow motion or fast motion. And what that does is it increases, the amount of, or increases or decreases the amount of light that falls on the celluloid. Generally, that's kind of... Um, uh, mitigate it or that that will either increase or decrease exposure so the aperture is generally changed that's how you get a film like Raging Bull where you go from regular speed to fast speed in a single shot without it getting super bright or super dark um, but for this film I was interested in actually documenting the process of trying to maintain that equal exposure and so what you see in front of me are these various variac dimmers in which uh, as, this, as ramping, uh, the film fluctuates in a single shot between uh, 15 to 250 frames a second. Um, and so basically what I'm doing is I'm chasing proper exposure. So through a meticulous process, I've kind of figured out what the correct lighting uh, coordinates for each in particular uh, uh, exposure is. And as the film kind of goes, you see me kind of pursue this um, uh, process and the pinwheel there it basically both obfuscates my face, which uh, is something that I've always particularly been interested in, um, kind of the filmmaker as character, but um, but all in the implied filmmaker, but also uh, it documents the actual um, element, the actual speed in which you're currently watching the film. Um, Jumping forward, this is a piece, uh, a recent piece I've completed called uh, Hyperway. It's a three-channel uh, feature-length video um, that I recently showed at Moskowitz Gallery Moskowitz Bays um, last this last year. Um, and in it, basically, uh, it uses um, Daniel Buren's essay, uh, Function of the Studio, as a jumping-off point to explore ideas around what it means to be human. Uh, in the essay, Buren talks about an artwork leaving its proper place and ceasing to be uh, the art that it was originally. And with that, I explore the idea of astronauts leaving Earth um, and ceasing to be human, and then to use that to explore ideas of what Earthling human mean, as well as what Heidegger describes as the Earth or the world. Um, but with the piece, uh, it kind of explores this idea of conceits. And for example, the film employs the car as an intergalactic spaceship. And you can either buy into the said conceit and go along with the film, or it just will functionally not work. Um, and that's something that I utilize a lot in my practice. There are these things that seemingly are very clearly special effects um, and reveal themselves to be. They're only partly convincing. But in that mode, it leaves the viewer in a place where they are kind of both able to be cognizant of the process of, of the storytelling, as well as um, consciously uh, suspend one's disbelief. So there's this idea of kind of both celebrating the sensuality of the common day object, as well as to demystify um, the uh, filming process. Um, and so often where this kind of takes, uh, takes forms is within these creatures in the films. Um, I'm just gonna real quickly just go through a couple of them to give you a sense. Um, 
This is another from Hyperway. This is a character called Star Maker. Um, just giving you a sense. And so the films kind of explore these various uh, scientific um, um, ideas. Oftentimes, I am uh, influenced by uh, science fiction theory, particularly Darko Servan's idea of cognitive estrangement, which basically asserts the idea that science fiction only functions in so much as there is an object that causes the rupture in what is our day-to-day -day experience. And oftentimes in my films, I use kind of creatures to, to play that form, but also I use the apparatus of cinema in general to kind of be that, um, to be that element where you're uh, both aware of the implied filmmaker and there are various techniques going over the heads of the characters within the story, um, but simultaneously there's a certain uh, cinematic pleasure that comes through that. Um, I also am interested, like in available light, I'm interested in kind of the affect of, this, of the image. Um, Hyperway utilizes, I think, five or six different um, uh, mediums, whether it's a high end HD video, 16 millimeter film, or here we have a toy camera um, that, uh, you know, very much kind of disrupts, kind of basically falls apart as you blow it up into HD. Um, and here I'm interested in the affective qualities for, uh, of, of an image and what we bring to the certain aesthetics of an image. Um, within the film, again, we're, I'm utilizing a lot of, um, kind of I'm playing with the, the, the apparatus of the camera. And here, for example, um, there, the, you know, in today's day and age, there is you know, a proliferation of drone photography, which I find to a certain degree exhausting. But um, I also was interested in kind of uh, uh, dissecting that. And so with that, in order to utilize a drone, I had to make a drone actually part of the, n the narrative, if you will. And I wanted these, you know, these kind of shots of the drone basically you know, anthropomorphized. And in order to do that, though, I, you know, I thought about potentially having a drone fly behind a drone, but that just seemed far too convoluted and complicated. So instead, um, working with my cinematographer, who I actually see here, Colin, hello, Colin. Um, we uh, constructed a rear projection system uh, in a studio. And, um, and here again, like there's this very kind of tactile quality. I, again, like I, I'm really interested in how to accomplish as much as possible literally within the camera. Um, and here is a perfect example. And one of the beauties of the effect that ultimately came, you can't really see it in the still, but um, A, you know, you see the scene slightly in the rear projection screen, which I was super excited about. But also there is a degree in which the propellers actually blow the rear projection screen. So you see it kind of flutter as the, as the drone goes. So it's just, it, and in watching it, you don't, you're not entirely sure of what effect it is that you're watching, but you're aware that there is something amiss in this world. Um, and that kind of takes us to uh, Viewing Stone, which is, I'm just seeing what time, oh, I got some time. I'm sure I'm going fast, wow, okay. Um, <laughs> Viewing Stone, uh, this is the piece we'll watch shortly. Um, with this, I've always been really particularly, uh, you know, enamored by, ast you know, NASA's photography of asteroids. Um, they're kind of, and I was also just been very interested in how asteroids have been kind of relegated to these like, <laughs> Uh, harbingers of doom within cinematic history at lot, writ large. And um, I was, you know, thinking about how seemingly asteroids are actually these kind of very docile um, objects that, you know, kind of aimlessly wander through space and keep to themselves. Um, and so I began to think about uh, the, the kind of the iconography of the asteroid as well as, um, you know, make, create links between, um, thinking about how if I was to make a kind of a struck film about an asteroid, how I would go about actually to create it. And it brought me to thinking a lot about um, CGI. And in general, I have you know, never utilized CGI in any of my films because it's something that I've always kind of had a, a fraught relationship with in which I struggle to watch any sort of CGI myself simply because though they have mastered water, hair, and all these various techniques, I still fundamentally believe they have not figured out gravity. Um, there seems to be a weightlessness to all objects uh, that I can't get personally get past. And so, but I also, be, I was very much interested in creating an object that seemingly sat in between this space where it seemed almost too perfect and too pristine to be a real object, but, all, but simultaneously didn't quite look CGI. And um, so that's where this film uh, came about kind of principally, but I was also thinking a lot about the myth of Sisyphus and generally ideas around um, 
kind of human's pursuit of meaning and the contradiction that people like Camus believes that kind of elicits. Um, that's something that a lot of the characters within the kind of the loose narratives are kind of grappling with. Um, they come, they basically come to various ideas through a sort of kind of rhizomatic space. Um, and I began to think of um, that, but then also kind of think about the, the boulder within the myth of Sisyphus is this object, uh, this theatrical object. Is, I thought we had to think, question whether it was a prop or whether Sisyphus was the prop, in the sense that he seemingly has no agency as he pushes up this, this rock of this hill because he's doing it without any purpose. Um, so there's all these kind of ideas kind of floating in a, uh, floating around in my head, um, which you'll kind of see take, take, uh, take form shortly. And then following these kind of, uh, kind of uh, films uh, that kind of follow this, these loose narratives, I also create the, I have a tendency recently to create these drawings that I call the Penrose series that take after Roger Penrose's um, diagrams of black holes or various uh, two distinct uh, points in space time. Um, these are arguably not scientific. Um, they simply <laughs> follow the, uh, uh, um, the mode in which time is you know, on our y-axis and space is on our x-axis. And they kind of became a process of mind mapping, but they also illustrate this idea that maps are stories in the sense that even though Something I often explore in a lot of my form, in a lot of the videos that I make is simply the fact that going from point A to point B is story, is, is narrative in its own right. Um, so these kind of have evolved over a period of time and kind of elicit elements within the grander kind of multiverse, if you will, of ideas that I'm trying to explore. And they linking, linking back up with the films, with link, link up with the photographs. And then these further began to find articulation in photography of mine, in which I began to laser into this, the plexiglass over the drawing. These also then take the form of these kind of uh, sculptural uh, uh, photographs. Um, and we're just kind of, and then most recently, just on, on the topic of, uh, you know, recent, uh, uh, you know, uh, coming attractions, if you will. Um, you know, black, the, the first black, ever since the first black hole image came to being as a child, I was always enamored by uh, black hole photography uh, or black hole artist uh, renditions of black holes growing up. And then when the first photograph came up, kind of realizing that iconography, I became really enamored with the idea of what it would the process be of actually creating a image, uh, a metaphorical image of a black hole, kind of akin to the process of creating this asteroid video, which you'll see shortly. Um, and with it, uh, after much kind of trial and error, uh, I finally came to the, um, the idea that basically the only way to create a black hole, a true black hole image would be to drill through the actual negative. Um, and in the process of basically creating these um, these negatives, basically the photo paper becomes the metaphorical equivalence to a black hole. Um, so with that said, um, here's self portraits black hole, um, and uh, I will uh, enjoy the video, thank you.